All right. So before we get going, I'm going to put you through some some questions here. Very serious five questions to to kind of set the stage for our, our interview. First, Let's do it. favorite movie series of all time. First one that came to mind, I actually don't watch movies, but Star Wars. Um, it was just one of the few series as a kid I like latched onto. And I just think there's so much um, symbolism in it. It's so relevant yeah. to just regular life. Who's your go-to Star Wars character? Uh, it used to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. I loved how he was the old, silent, quiet leader. Yeah. Um, I think it still is. Okay. Um, see, I'm more I'm more dark side. I'm more like Vader, Boba Fett. The more character I think it was, uh, yeah. I liked. But okay. So Star Wars. And then what's the fear you have in life? Not being adequate enough. Um, that's probably the one biggest fear that looms over my head, which creates a lot of awesome things because it makes me work really hard. But at the same mm -hmm. day, at the same time, I think I'm always seeking validation through achievement or success or affirmations of other people. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty deep right there. We can unpack that. Guilty pleasure you have? Sugar. Um, I'm trying to get off of sugar. And actually, in fact, I eat it, consume it a lot less than I used to. But I hate how much I love sweets. Okay. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 28. Oh my gosh. So you're fine. Sure. Sugar don't do nothing to you. When you get my age, then you even look at it and all of a sudden you start getting a little double chin and all this other stuff. Uh oh, I haven't got the double chin yet, but stay off sugar. So <laughs> um book, book recommendation for you. The noticer. Um, one of my coaches, my college track coach, he had suggested the book maybe about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's a book about perspective. And essentially, this invisible man walks around the earth. He gives people perspective. And ever since then, my whole mindset has shifted about the purpose of perspective and specifically when to give it to people. I like that. Okay. We'll have that listed under our resource recommendations. And a really deep question here that I like to ask all of our guests you could have dinner with three historical figures who are no longer with us. Who would you dine with? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, probably Jesus. I would dine with Jesus. He's number gotta... one draft pick every time. Oh, really? Yeah, every that's time. Not... I uh, I felt like that would be like an answer a lot of people would say, but it's literally the first thing that came to mind, and I actually believe it to be true. Um. Probably number two is why well, I don't know why I'm struggling with this so much. Probably some type of historic basketball coach like Bobby Slick Leonard of the Pacers. Okay. Um, the way he rallied for Indiana and what he did for the organization was huge. And to this day, the impact he made still is relevant in the city of Indianapolis. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, and then the third one would probably be some type of musician. Um, Uh, maybe like Justin Bieber. Let's just say a fun one, man. <laughs> I don't even know why, but I just think that um, the way he's grown his brand and scaled his brand is super cool, and it's probably something to be learned from. Okay, all right. He, and just for our listeners, he's still with us. He's still with us. But oh, we'll oh, they have to be passed. <laughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> but we'll go. With, we'll go with it. I don't want anybody to start like reporting that he's he's no longer with us or anything. But okay, so that's a good group right there. Now. One thing that I'm really curious about with you is your upbringing. Before we started uh, recording, you mentioned that you grew up uh, Army brat, Fayetteville. So I'm, I'm right up the road, like, you know, 45 minutes away in Lumberton. So talk to us about your upbringing. What were some of the aspirations you had and what was military life like for you? Well, to be honest, um, when we were subject to military life, we were so young that a lot of it I don't even remember. And in mm -hmm. fact, somebody asked me the other day, like specifically, they were like, what was a memory of your sophomore year of high school that stood out to you? And my sophomore year of high school was 12 years ago. But even then, I couldn't really remember yeah. at any specific moment. And so I'm, I'm a little disappointed to say that I can't remember much of my upbringing. However, I will say that as a young person, I don't think I really had ambitions because I didn't understand what they were. Um, I didn't consume a lot of media. I didn't consume a lot of music. So what I had was what I saw. So for me, it was just kind of a more of a mindset of survival. Yeah. Well, you mentioned survival. I saw you were, you were left by your parents. What was that story about? Yeah. So, um, 
we, my brother and I, we were left by our parents and we ended up being in rural Indiana. So Seymour, Indiana, Jackson County, Southern Indiana represent. Um, and How'd that was an interesting deal to Indiana. Well, so my grandparents had had roots. My mom was from Seymour, Indiana, um, mm-hmm. and that's where she was from. But then, of course, she moved out with my father to North Carolina um, when my brother and I were had. But, you know, they just decided the parenthood thing wasn't really for them. And next thing I know, we go from a predominantly black Hispanic area in Fayetteville to like 98 percent rural white space in Seymour, Indiana. Mm. How old were you? Um, I was old enough to remember. So probably somewhere around elementary to middle school. Um, I want to say fourth or fifth, but we were also on and off going back and forth between Indiana and North Carolina a lot. So, uh, for my brother and I, we were never really completely confident or sure where it was going to be that we were sleeping at, but shout out to my grandparents because they always stepped up and they always showed up and they they showed us a lot of love that certain kids that move around a lot are void of. Yeah. You mentioned your grandparents took you in and you, as you mentioned, growing up as a black man in a predominantly white area, prejudice, I mean, discriminant, what all types of stuff did you have to endure as a young kid? Well, see, my closest friend actually was Hispanic, so we were kind of in it together. It was one of those things that there weren't a lot of um, melanated or brown people in our space, but that's definitely something we related on without even recognizing why. And so we were unpacking this uh, maybe about six months ago, um, really trying to dig up some things in our past we went through or that we faced and that we struggled with. And one thing, it wasn't particularly that we were constantly uh racially attacked or anything like that i mean of course you get the random slurs all the time but to me that's not what like true prejudice is we kind of saw it in the in the in the things that weren't said and uh, we recalled a math bowl experience we had where myself uh, my hispanic friend and my filipino friend were all paired in a group together okay. uh, we remember being put in the back corner of the class and I, we always just remember like never really getting the support, never getting the encouragement, never getting the attention that we needed to believe that we were smart. So we never considered that we were athletic. We never considered that we were smart, not because people were telling us that we weren't, but because people never were telling us that we were. We weren't having that constant encouragement that perhaps some of the other students that had the perfect upbringing or had that image that fit the narrative of the school. Some of those things were left out. And so now as an adult, we're recognizing other spaces in our life where we look for that validation or those affirmations because we didn't get those growing up in our school systems. Mm, Yeah. And it's just that, uh, inclusion, I guess, more than anything else, that inclusion and that affirmation, um, to push you forward. And you mentioned earlier affirmation of others. Uh, do you think that's something that stems from your childhood? Like constantly seeking that out based on what you just were talking about a second ago? Well, if I'm being completely honest, it's one of those things that as an adult, I tried to deny the reality of it and say, oh, I don't need anybody to, uh, you know, alpha male. Uh, I got this. Just me. Lone wolf. I'm the one. I'm just going to encourage myself. I'm going to go after it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But then I would find out there was always like this cliffhanger at the end of Mm. everything that I would do of like, "Um, hey, guys, how was it? And of course, the entrepreneur, the tech guy in me, the sales guy in me makes me want to assume that, oh, it's just because the feedback loop has it completely closed. It's yeah. stopped. But the reality of it was is I needed affirmations. I needed some love. I needed people to tell me that. And until I could diagnose that and see that, I'm walking around with a blind spot and I'm chasing affirmations in all the spaces that are not actually allowing me to progress forward as a man. Mm. Okay. And I mean, you talk about like getting hit with something that you got to struggle and fight through and and needing people there for you as a teen, you were diagnosed with stage four Burkitt's lymphoma. What do you remember about that whole experience? And because like you said, I believe on your, your bio, that was pretty much a death sentence for you at that time. Yeah. Um, and the crazy thing is, is, I didn't find that out till after the fact. I didn't realize how serious it was really? until I start connecting the dots backwards. Cause you know, you're 14. All you really care about, well, at least all I cared about 14 was girls, sports, and hanging out with my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else was kind of invisible. But I, I remember that day when I got a note when I was in class to say, Hey, Mon, you have a doctor's appointment. I'm thinking, a doctor's appointment for what? 
Well, flash forward the previous year, I couldn't open my mouth more than about uh, a little over. I think the number was like six centimeters. So it was a really small mouse. So I had to pull my food, and just push it through my teeth or just drink liquids to have food um, because I actually had a tumor that was compounding and not allowing my mouth to open. So that was for and about a year you had to do that? Yeah, about eight months to a year, I kept getting wow. misdiagnosed with like TMJ, all these other things that weren't actually what I was struggling with. Yeah. And then when I would get food down, I couldn't keep any of it up because I had multiple tumors around my pancreas and my stomach that were just sending the food right back out. Um, and so I was pretty malnutrition, like my, my energy, I was not much sustenance. I actually had to quit basketball because I actually, in my mind, Going back to what I said before, nobody was telling me that I was actually an athlete. So in my head, I'm thinking, I can't keep up with these other guys because they're better than I am yeah. or they're stronger than I am or whatever this thing is. But the reality of it is, is I just didn't have enough sustenance in my body because I couldn't eat. Um, And so then it just started getting progressively worse and worse points where I'd have headaches so bad I couldn't see so that I couldn't see in class. And now I'm wondering, like, am I even do I have like ADD? Like what's going on? Like, why can't I not focus? Why can't I literally not see the board? And I'm just trying to make all these excuses up for what's going on. Um, and then next thing I know I blink and I'm sitting in that hospital bed and they're saying, Hey, this is what we found. Um, this is what we got to do. Um, and we don't have a choice because this is a life or death situation. You're in stage four now. And so treatment starts tomorrow. And, as a young person, having everything just being taken away in a moment like that and then being confined to what was my own jail cell really gave me a lot of time to think and really gave me a lot of time to start developing perspective that now, you know, 14 years later, it's been the cornerstone to understanding life in a completely different perspective. Yeah, it's, it was really crazy. You say it was only 14 years ago. It's not a long time. Uh, what do you remember about that experience, like who was there for you? What was your mentality like? Can you recall any of that? Yeah. So when we started living with my grandparents full time, my grandma was a stay at home grandma. So her main focus was to make sure that me and my brother were getting love and being loved yeah. on while my grandfather was at work. And so she was there with me every single night in the hospital, which is something that a lot of kids, especially teenagers, don't have the benefit or option to say because their parents still have to work to put food yeah. on the table. And so shout out to my grandpa for his sacrifices, but also to my grandma as well for being there with me. Um, and she was just there to serve me and take care of me and wash me and feed me and just love on me. And that's when my relationship really grew with her because yeah. that was the first time in my life where I had somebody that was solely focused on being there for me because I didn't have that as an infant. I didn't have that as a toddler. I didn't have that as a kid. And so I refer to wanting to have dinner with Jesus earlier. And then I think about like how my grandma essentially sacrificed what should have been the best years of her life mm -hmm. to pour in and love me it told me that there's something deeper about this life thing that certain people have that at 14, I don't have yet. And so I have to spend this next 10, 20, 30, 40 years uncovering what that mode and mindset of sacrifice is, because that's why I believe I'm really here. Yeah. Wow. That's good stuff right there. And yeah, just someone being there for you, being selfless. And I mean, it's incredible that at that time, that's when you really got someone to, to, really buy in and, and and pour into you that first time your parents. Do you talk to your parents to this day? Um, so I've recently crazy enough, um, got back in contact with both of my parents. Now do we talk often? I can't say that we do, but, um, it was actually kind of a crazy story about how I ended up meeting my dad. If you care for me to share, let's do it. That's what we're here for. Yeah. So um, I own a faith-based clothing company called Believe Brand. And what we do is we sell very minimal logos and subtle designs, but it's basically the whole point of it is to start conversations. So whether you believe in God, whether you believe in Jesus or not, that's why we don these logos. We wear them on our stuff. And so uh, during the pandemic, a friend of mine, a lot of people were reaching out saying like, hey, I am tired of my nine to five job. I want to go start a side hustle. Um, let me go ask him on how he built his clothing brand. Mind you, I was three years in it at this point already. So I'm sure my advice was terrible, but um, I had a friend that had come over and it was, it was, I don't know about you, but for me during the pandemic hours didn't exist. It was just a day. Yeah. So 
This is probably about 10 30, 11 30 at night. Longest friend, leave of my life, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> literally. Um, I'm just gonna call mine sabbatical since I learned so much. But um I was talking to my friend, I was teaching her, I was saying, Hey, look, to have a successful brand, you don't actually need a successful social media funnel. That's a way to be successful in e-commerce, but it's not the way to be successful. Mm-hmm. I said, let's go through and check out um, some of our customers. And so I saw this name. The first name I saw, it was an African name. They had an LA billing address, but a Chicago shipping address. I'm like, oh, this is a, an anomaly. Like this person obviously has a name that is not, I've never heard of it before. So that tells me that there's something different about this person. Okay, cool. They live in LA, but now they mm-hmm. must be visiting Chicago. So they must have a lot to learn. Let's look yeah. at this customer profile. So we pop on their Instagram and uh, like a lot of people over the age of 50, um, they only had one Instagram picture and it was like a blown up picture of their face. And I don't know what it was about that specific picture, but I'm like, I need to find more about this person. Like this is the one I want to find out about. And so I start going on Facebook. I copy the name and I put it on Facebook and I start looking through the pictures because the the individual had a public profile. I see pictures of Magic Johnson. I see pictures of Kobe Bryant. I see pictures of these luxury estates, these amazing supercars. And then I see this one picture. He's got one arm over an NBA jersey, a referee jersey, and the other arm over a WNBA jersey. I think, dang, this looks like my brother. And then in a moment like this feeling just flushed through me. I was like, I think this is my dad. Whoa. I wasn't ready for that. And so 1130 at night, I send a message, no capitalization, no punctuation. Are you my dad? And with two seconds, I get a response that says, yes, I've been praying for years about when you would reach out. But my mother always told me, wait for you. Wait for your sons. They'll reach out to you. Don't force it. Wow. And next thing I know, I'm in a conversation about his trauma that he went through in the military, having survived certain things. Um, we're talking about his experience as a DJ, which if they, if anybody doesn't know, I'm also a professional DJ. He starts talking about his experience in the NBA, in the WNBA as an official. And I just realized like, wow, like we have so much in common, even though the only thing that we have in common right now is our biological ties. Cause I didn't have him as an example to look up to because, you know, unfortunately I just didn't have that privilege of having a dad in my life. And so, um, yeah, do I talk to my parents much more now than I used to, but I, I just can't help but not share that story sometimes because just how crazy everything came Jeez. out. No one else on the face of this earth would have gone to those links to find him like that, like that route. Everybody else would have done a, you know, what are the little DNA tests or uh, yeah, the ancestry test ancestry.com or there would have been, yeah. like, you know, my family tree. I can't fit, but wow. That's honestly in, in the hundred plus episodes I've done. This is one of the craziest stories I've heard. I mean, I really mean that. And one of the most inspiring stories. So that's super cool. I appreciate you opening up and sharing that. Uh, was that, when was that? No, you said during the pandemic. So 2020. Yeah. So it's 2020. And the crazy part about it was, is my father had actually learned the lineage of his name. And so his American name, he changed. So he had four African names. And that's why I never recognized. I couldn't find him on the internet whenever I searched for him or anything like that, because he wasn't under the alias that I had always known him to be under. And so to me, that was the craziest part. Wow. And he, his time in the army, was that during like desert storm? Um, so it would have been between 91 and 98, I would believe. Yeah. So he was probably getting in there around time, desert storm. That was, that was February 91. Okay. And did you ever find out what he did in the military? Um, no, actually I have yet to ask, but that's a, I'm going to add that to my bucket list of like a hundred questions. I have just, uh, the, the, as a man, I just always wanted to know. I've just always yeah. been curious. Stuff. I, I would definitely say like, throw that out there because um i know so many people who like my dad was in the navy and i never really talked to my dad about what he did in the navy until i ended up finding like paperwork and stuff uh after he had passed but if i could just sit down and talk to him about his time and service i'd love to to see that because back then that's that's that vietnam leadership era and that i mean 
Definitely. Um, men, mental health wasn't a thing people talked about. Um, probably from like sixties all the way up until probably early mid two thousands. You just don't talk about, you know, the, the mental toll that it takes on you. So yeah, I'm definitely curious how that would go. Um, well, oh, go speaking ahead. about, speaking about the mental toll, I mean, that's part of my father's testimony. And as a man, like as much resentment as I want to hold for him not being in my life, I recognize that he talked about a situation in which 20, 26 people were on some type of flight or aircraft. Okay. Um, it ends up ranking 24 of the 26 people pass away and he's one of the two that survives. Mm. So that alone, I think about the PTSD that he probably oh carries God. as a man and then to have to take that as a father and a disciplinary. It's like now, like I, if I look at truth for what truth is, I understand like, well, no wonder he struggled with stuff like that. Who knows what he's going through in his own mind or his own heart. I mean, mm. heck as, as a man, there's been times I've been frustrated about a pickup basketball game. And I went off with somebody imagine carrying something like that, where you see 24 of your brothers die in a moment's notice. And now you're one of the two left to tell the story and hold that guilt maybe you wish you would have done something different or who knows i was gonna say it was probably guilt and then it's probably some sort of attachment issue uh fear of losing people especially when you lose 24 people so it's yeah there my wife is into psychiatry or, or um, psychology she could literally sit down and unpack that all day i'm a regret not recording after i talk to her um no but that's that's crazy story and you did some, I mean, talk about overcoming obstacles. You overcame your battle with cancer. Talk to us about the, you know, crossing that finish line of being like, all right, I, I beat this battle that I, I had no chance of even starting with. Yeah. So that, that was crazy because, um, it happened my freshman year. So freshman, sophomore year, I'm going through treatment. I'm getting better. Um, junior years, the first year I come back around, I start, okay, let me start living a normal life again. Mind you, I'm okay. still in high school. Next thing I know, I find out that because the chemotherapy that I dealt with was so aggressive, certain parts of my body were functioning as if I were 50, 60 years old. One of those being my heart. So mm -hmm. I go to try to retry out for basketball and make it right this time. And and I pass out during one of our practices. And again, it's still in the back of my mind. I'm thinking, okay, am I just not fit for this athletic sports, competitive driven culture or what's going on? So end up sitting out that basketball season. And then I have my first track season. I start doing therapy, recovering through that. Um, and then I start to grow up a little bit because at this point I'm 16 going into 17. Mm -hmm. you, know, you start to get a couple muscles, even though you don't lift and uh, yep. you're getting your man. You got that skinny swole. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. well, exactly. Senior year comes around and I don't know what it is, but I, a switch just flipped in my life and in my body. And it was the first year I've actually had multiple months where I could actually train towards something. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, um, and I don't say this to aggrandize myself, but just to tell the story, next thing I know, I'm much more competitive in a physical space than I've ever been in my life. And because I start to catch my affirmations and my value in that space, I even recognize it's carrying over to my academics as well. So I'm showing up feeling like the man when I'm taking my test. I'm showing up feeling like the man when I'm on the track, when I'm on the court, yeah. when I'm talking to girls, like everything seemed to finally start working out. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm thinking D1 or bust. Long story short, I got zero D1 offers. The one offer I got was a division two school. And it ended up, even though I was very like regrudgingly attending this university, it ended up being one of the best decisions of my life because I met the two biggest mentors I ever had. Well, flash forward to my freshman year of college. Next thing I know, I get diagnosed again with cancer. And I'm mm. thinking like, it's like, this cannot be true. Like I just spent this whole year working toward this thing, grinding in and out, working on my diet, doing all this little stuff. And in a moment's notice yet again, it was taken away from me. But this time it was so much different. I was kind of confused the first time. And the second time I was pissed off. I was angry. I was mad. I was frustrated. Yeah. And that was the first time in my life where I actually started having like anxiety and I started having like mental struggles. And then they tried to clinically diagnose me with depression when I was at the hospital. And in that moment, it's almost crazy for me to say that it wasn't cancer 
that made me feel like enough is enough. It was when they diagnosed me with depression that enough is enough because I knew in my mind, I had never been depressed before. Like I am not a depressive person and I am not one of those people that carry that depressed, um, uh, chemical imbalance in my body. I just believed it. I could not believe that to be true for me. And so that's when I really started diving into that conversation we we're talking about earlier about perspective. That was the first time I got that book, The Noticer, mm -hmm. my sophomore or my freshman sophomore year of college. Um, that's when I first started to connect the dots about my faith and my spirituality. That's when I first started to connect the dots really about what my grandma was doing for me and how much she was serving me. And and I, I kid you not, I keep talking about these moments in my life where switches flip. That was a moment in my life where I was like, I don't care what diagnosis I have. I don't care what affirmations I have. I don't care what is on the other side of any of this stuff. I refuse to continue to live a life that's about me and feel this empty when things are taken away. But one thing people cannot take away is how I treat other people, how I serve other people, how I show up for other people, the type of questions I'm asking, the type of conversations I'm doing or anything I'm doing for everybody else. And so when I took the focus and pressure off of me and healing myself and getting better, I actually felt found on the reverse, I was healing, getting better and feeling a much more holistic life experience. Isn't it crazy? It's almost like your life in, in that short amount of time went full circle for what your grandmother was doing for you. And, and, and that's where you were finding your purpose and passion in life was, was giving back to others, just like she gave to you when you were suffering. So that's crazy to hear. Um, it seems to me like listening to your story that you really, I don't think anybody understands life, like really, really gets it. It's so complex. It's so deep. But I think your uh, mindset and mentality, even when it comes to things like depression, anxiety, you're so far ahead of the curve uh, than, than most people that I've, I've dealt with. So when someone does suffer from something like anxiety, anxiety can hit people out of nowhere. I mean, you can be told you got to go do a task right now. Anxiety kicks in. You're told something's bad news and we automatically go to the end of the world. Uh, what advice would you have for a listener out there who's really, really struggling with anxiety? Yeah, well, I think the first thing that we have to do is we have to confirm and agree that anxiety is a real thing and people mm -hmm. really struggle with it and it can really ruin lives, ruin careers, ruin marriages, relationships and everything. So number one, acknowledge the fact that you have it. Mm -hmm. But then number two, also acknowledge that anxiety is an internal endeavor. It's one of those silent battles. It's one of those things that perhaps maybe somebody that's trained can see it on the outside, but for the most time, it's camouflaged within you. But then to also recognize that typically the anxiety that you have is about something that's outward focused. So whether it's a speech that you have to give or whether it's a feeling like you're inadequate to the people you're around or social anxiety, whatever that thing is. And so now what you, you got to do is, is you got to bridge that gap between the outward expression and that inward expression. And so for me, like when I'd have anxiety, when it came to track or when it came to a sales meeting or when it came to a DJ competition in those spaces, I recognize I can actually control that anxiety through being prepared, right? So if it's anxiety about talking in front of a ton of people or doing this or doing that, what are little micro moments in which you can prepare for that? to start to subdue and suppress a bit of that anxiety. But then for me, and this is just what's worked for me, when I think about the internal anxiety where it's not a conversation about preparation, I start recognizing uh, what you focus on increases. So, and, th and that's actually a quote from the book, The Noticer. It's one of those quotes I just can never forget. What you focus on increases. In the moments that I'm having that anxiety inside of me, I notice I'm focusing on me. I'm making everything about me. And I'm literally sitting in that space of low or stress or whatever that is. But when I shift my focus and I start focusing on people outside of me, now all of a sudden I start to realize that that begins to relinquish that a lot. Now that doesn't mean that you don't still fill up your cup and you make sure that you have what you need to do what you need to get done. I'm not saying that at all, but what I'm saying is once you have already taken the time to take care of yourself, make sure that you take that focus off of yourself and yeah. watch how things change. Yeah, that's really good advice. That's uh had a previous guest who said it's almost like wearing that helmet with mirrors and it's all focused on us. And you're going to continue to struggle if you don't start to pull those mirrors and focus them outwards. 
on on other people. And we're built as society. I mean, with social media like it is for us all to wear that helmet. Um, yeah, that's good stuff. What what you focus on increases. Yep. So next thing for you is uh, let, let's talk about some of this. I mean, great stuff you're doing out there. Like you built a highly successful tech company. Talk to us about that piece. Yeah. So talk about uh, feeling inadequate, right? Yeah. <laughs> a, a young black man in technology, you just don't see it very often. And so um, that was another situation. And every, every time there's been any type of achievement in my life, there's always been somebody specifically in most cases of the majority that has taken me in, allowed me to be me. And I almost call it like a shape up, like uh, when you get, you know, your beard lined up or whatever, they've always shaped it up to a point where it can still look like me, but then be presentable in a way that allows success to happen. So with technology, I was blessed with one of the best business partners. It was a software engineer, software developer, spent years in code, but he just needed somebody that had a little bit of swag. He needed somebody that could communicate and help him put his vision for his product out to the market, sell that, close those deals, get that feedback and learn how we could build a different project or a better product, I should say. And so that was one of those really big moments in my life because that was like the first time I, I thought that I was doing something that was like on a massive scale, not just like a small community scale, but on a massive yeah. scale. Um, and I guess it's all relative, right? Uh, how, what massive is, but uh, that was such a fun experience. I, I can't lie. Probably one of my favorite life experiences was being a part of that tech company. And there was only two of us. Really? Mm -hmm. how, how long were you working with that? Uh, that was about a four-year project that we ended up working on it together. Wow. Was that during the pandemic as well? Um, so it was at this, it was like a couple years before the pandemic and then leading up through the pandemic. And so then once things got to that like semi-normal stage, that's when yeah. uh, we, ended, we ended up uh, doing different things after that. Speaking of the pandemic, I, I love to ask this question. What was the biggest thing you learned about yourself during that era? How much time I waste, for sure. Uh, <laughs> no kidding. How much money I waste, how much focus I waste. I mean, at that point, it was, I guess it was easy to be distracted, like on your phone. But as far as like all these trinkets out in the earth, you really didn't have those. Yeah. So for me, I recognize that like I'm kind of a lot of my success has been a lot of luck. Like, yeah, I worked hard, but I didn't work like obsessively focused hard. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I say my days became my nights, that was like the first time where I was actually sitting down working on specific DJ skills for hours on end. That was the first mm -hmm. time I'm actually learning specific technology and SaaS moments hours on end. That was the first time I was actually working out and refining my body in a way that would make me stronger as a man hours on end. And so yeah. that's when I learned it doesn't actually take a lot to be successful. It just takes a lot of focus in a specific amount of time. Yeah. I, I feel for anyone. I've had friends, I've had family who've been, uh, who were ill. And I know people out there have lost family members during the pandemic. Uh, but I, I think it was really, a, it was ultimate test of like for you, us to measure internally where we were at with our lives. Some people came out of it and they're like, I can't stay in this house with this family days on end. They're absolutely driving me crazy. Uh, some were saying I got nothing out of it, but so many people I talked to are like, I really excelled or I picked up a new trait or I got better. Or I realized instead of me wasting all this time, Oh my gosh, the silver lining is this was like a, a blessing uh, in, in terms of having this happen to me to where I could understand, I could change kind of the trajectory of your life moving forward. Um, and, and you've done some, also, I mean, you mentioned the faith-based retail company that you have, uh, Believe Brand. How did that brainchild get started there? Yeah. So specifically the retail company or just businesses in general? Yep. The retail company. Yes. With the retail company, I recognize that we were, we we're basically walking billboards. We wear a lot of things that don't particularly represent us or speak to what we believe in, whether mm. that be um, spiritual or, you know, professional or even with your hobbies and stuff. And so there just got a point where, as I started building my DJ brand, I was like, you know, I want people to know me something for something outside of just the music that you hear. 
So why don't I just start wearing the a logo that represents my faith? And so maybe people ask about it and maybe people never don't, but either way, it's my brand logo. It's what we're going to walk with. And so it started off as a me thing, but the market has an interesting way of validating products. If it's good, people are going to talk about it. Or if it's worth talking about, people are going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so I had people on both ends of the spectrum, actually three inches of the spectrum, people that were Christians that agreed with the message that loved the shirts, non-Christians, but they were still very religious that asked me why I wanted to be a Christian. And then even people that didn't believe in God or anything spirituality at all saying like, why do you wear that? And so it started creating conversations that I felt like I just couldn't keep to myself. Like if I can wear this all day, but like, I think other people should have the benefit of wearing some of this stuff and having these conversations as well. And so as the product was validated, um, we just started making more and it just started growing and growing and growing and scaling. And so then the next thing I realized was, is I didn't really care about the monetary side of this because at this point I was DJing still and I had the tech company. And for me, like giving back, I told you service meant a lot to me. So instead of me just taking some of my earned income from these other spaces, I said, why don't we just get rid of all the money that we make for this. And that doesn't mean that we're a nonprofit by any means. We're still, we're built as a for-profit business, but at the end of all of our statements, we say, okay, what can we support? Whose life can we encourage with this? What kind of money can we give away for this? And I, again, I don't say this to share my support or share what I'm trying to do for other people, but I say that to say like, that was the heart behind the business that made it so much easier for me to want to continue to invest into it and grow it to a certain point. That's awesome. I mean, just the giving back aspect. And then like you said, just taking that brand and and having is that what the hat stems from? This is actually fear of God. So this is a designer out in LA, Jerry Lorenzo. Um, but it's a similar concept. People say, "What is the G on your hat?" Just like you just asked me. Next mm-hmm. thing I know, we're in a conversation about, "Oh, I wear this because I was inspired by this designer." Um, I have my own retail company. This is what it means to me. And next thing you know, we're in a whole dialogue about it. Yep, you lured me right into it. I <laughs> lured you right into it. Let's I was go. Like, I got to ask about the hat now. So. <laughs> Well, you also mentioned during the pandemic, uh, that's where you were able to uh, really work on your DJ skills. When did you realize that was the talent you have? Um, So let me just be completely honest. Like when I first started, I was terrible. Like many people with many things. I think some people assume that like, wow, I get that comment. Come on, you're so talented. And I'm like, thanks, because five years ago, you would have never said that. (laughs) Um, I actually, it's still crazy to this day. And I don't know if this is like a childhood thing or what that I need to uncover to this day. I actually still don't think I'm very good as a DJ, but for some reason, the clients and the opportunities keep showing up. And over the past three, four years, they keep getting bigger and bigger. So I guess I'm doing something right. But the short story about how that happened was, is when I was in college, my teammates loved to party every single weekend three days a weekend. And for me being their leader, being their captain, I'm thinking like, okay, they're going to party whether I'm there or not. So I might as well show up, be their DD, make sure they get to point A, point B, make sure they don't take no girls home, make sure they don't get too drunk. You better not be touching no substance because I'm going to be there watching like, you know, the big brother in the house. Good for you. I show up to this party and next thing I know, I'd be bored out of my mind because I'm the type of guy that if I don't have utility, once I'm in a certain situation, like I just feel useless because my utility was pre-party and post-party, but during party, I'm standing on the back of the wall. So one day somebody asked me to play music at this party. And then when I recognized that, wait a second, the music I just happened to like happens to be music to people want to party to the entrepreneur brain started kicking in in me and it started off as just like, okay, let me do this as a thing to do while I'm at these parties. But the next thing I'm I'm like, okay, how can I grow this? How can I scale this? How can I audit this? What needs to be better? Next thing I know, I'm buying a ton of DJ equipment and uh, I'm traveling the country, just DJing all the time. And I, I can't, I can't speak on how much it's meant to me as my life, because for me, that's been a creative outlet that's allowed that other side of my brain, the non-analytical side, the creative side to fire up that now allows me to actually enjoy doing the hard stuff in the tech company, because I know that when the weekend comes around, I got that creative outlet I can now like dive into. Yeah. And just to apply some context, so this was like, what, 08, somewhere around there when you got started with it? Uh, no, so this is college, excuse me, freshman year of college. So this is probably 2012. 2012. All right. Oh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Actually, I didn't go to my first party until I was 21. That is not true. It was 2015, 2016. That's when it was. Yeah. Okay. 2015, yeah. 2016. All right. And how in the world did you transition from I'm bored, hanging out back here with my Sprite on the back of the wall 
uh, to now um, with the Pacers and the Hoosiers? Well, I just think I thank God for just the perspective because the way I've always operated is is when I purchase things or when I walk through things and let's say like um, I want to purchase a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. I don't just go into the store and purchase the t-shirt. I try to think in my mind like why did I purchase that t-shirt here? What was the price of the t-shirt? What was the return on my investment? I think of all these like little weird subcategories of just a t-shirt. I do the same. I, I think it's the shark tank in me. I, I do the same. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So as an entrepreneur, you understand exactly where I'm going with this. And so as I would look and I would see my product, what I'm doing as a DJ, and as I'd listen to other DJs because I came hyper-focused, I'm sure you're like this with podcasts now too, mm -hmm. because you're in that space, you're hyper-focused of what everybody else in that space is also doing. And I just recognize there's certain things about DJs. A lot of DJs are taking a lazy way out. And they're just getting to a point where they can make good money, but they're not really investing into this love and this passion. And then I thought, well, what if I took what I learned from the business person as a technologist and what I'm learning as a creative watching mm. these other DJs and marry that relationship and then start pitching and proposing and reaching out and doing marketing campaigns about my brand as a DJ. And that's when I started seeing like all these opportunities unlock that I was completely invisible for before. Hmm. How, how, did, how in the world did you land those gigs? Like, how did that happen? Did the Pacers call you? Did Indiana get Coach Knight on the phone to recruit you? Like, what in the world happened there? All right, I just need all the men that are listening to this to close their eyes and imagine the girl of their dreams knocks on their front door and says, I want to marry you. Okay. And she checks all the boxes. What are the likelihoods of that happening had she never met you or heard of you before? Very unlikely. I would almost say zero. Yeah. And so like people see that and they think like, oh, the Pacers must have reached out to you or heard about you through this thing or that thing. Like, no, this was years of being told. No, this is sending email. This is showing up to the arenas. This is showing up to the games, writing out like, hey, this is my report on the game and what I think could have went better from an entertainment standpoint. And then saying, um, no, thanks. You have no experience. Um, no, thanks. We've mm -hmm. never heard of you. No, thanks. It's not in our budget. This is with IU and Pacers. This is multiple years of constant follow-up, constant pitching, constant networking until somebody said, all right, Iman, we're going to give you a shot. And the shot they gave me was like bottom line. You bring your own gear. You DJ outside of the arena as fans walk past for like 13 seconds. And if you like it, but if we like you, cool, that's about all we're going to give you. But literally putting everything into that one experience, even though I had no idea what was going to be on the other side, people recognizing, wait a second, this guy's literally taking this as if he's, he's DJing outside of a regular season game and he's treating this like he's about to DJ for the Super Bowl. Like yeah. this guy really cares. And through them noticing that I cared and through them noticing that I've been putting years of investing into this thing, now all of a sudden they give you a, a bigger yes and then a bigger yes and then a bigger yes to the point where now I look back and I can say, oh yeah, I had this all planned out. But three years ago, I wasn't doing any of this. I had no clue it was even mm. possible. Just persistence. Persistence and persistence overcomes resistance. And once you learn that, you understand that and you create a plan of action to do that, you find out now you have purpose for all those random nights where you're staying up for long hours, investing into that thing you truly believe in or you enjoy. Yeah. And we talked about being with the Hoosiers and, and what happened when Matar Heels went up there this, this past year. <laughs> but you know, I've noticed that though, because so we go to North Carolina, they got a DJ. Uh, at their games, an entertainer out there on the court. Georgia Tech, uh, we just went there on Saturday. They have one as well. You're starting to see a lot more colleges incorporate that in as opposed to just the old school cheerleaders run out there and dance. Uh, you know, the PA announcer tells you about their local sponsors. So it, it definitely does add a different vibe to it, which is really cool to see. Um, for you, question here, what what is next for you? Like what's that next big thing you want to do? I don't know if you, um, it's a curse and a blessing, but mm -hmm. sometimes n 
it never seems like enough is enough as if there's always something bigger to achieve or bigger oh, to yeah. obtain. And I had to just take a step back the other day while I was at assembly hall and just look around and be grateful. And so I think the immediate thing for me to do right now in this season is to be so grateful for these opportunities that have been given and I've been allowed to be a part of. And then also I got to figure out like if we want to keep scaling this and if we want to keep growing this, I really want to give my best I don't think my best is just staying where I'm at with my skill set or where I'm at, even with my opportunities. And so I want to see the world, you know, I want to know how other cultures see DJing. I want to understand that from a full holistic experience, but even with technology, like I want to see a technology company that it's not just two people. I want to see a technology company where I'm giving people that may have never gotten the look like the same look that I wanted when I was younger. I want to be able to give them that look. And so yeah. oh, I got to hit the whiteboard. I got to hit the drawing board. And I got to start coming, taking a problem-based approach to figuring out how I can build systems that allow other people to succeed. I mean, with the DJ company right now, I do have an intern and, you know, he's a guy just like me, you know, a young melanated brother from the inner city that's now in a space that's a little bit more rural. And to see him find his own identity and his own purpose and passion through the sacrifices we've made as a DJ company gives me hope that like there's actually value in that. And if I can figure out how to do that on a larger scale and scale more things up, then I think that uh, I'll, I'll be really proud of just the work our community's done for all this stuff. Yeah. When we hit stop on recording. I got something to, to run by you, an idea. Um that occurred to me over the weekend to deal with technology and, and bigger spaces like arenas. So uh, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go to? Uh, yeah. So my name is Iman. I am a in, but smooth. I am on Tucker. Um, you can find me, just look me up on Google, just Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. I try to be everywhere because I don't really ever want to pigeonhole um, how I want to shoot content out versus how my media may want to receive it. So um, just Google Iman Tucker and you'll find it and whatever you want to, whatever medium you want to look at, just put it in afterwards. I'm sure you'll find it right away. And then what do you want your legacy to be 50 years from now? That's a great question. Um, and I got to be honest with you, like the older I'm getting, I say that not being very old or maybe I'm young and immature and saying this and forgive me if that's the case, but I don't think I'm really all that concerned with legacy anymore because I've just seen so many amazing athletes, uh, so many amazing artists that have been taken away too soon their legacies become almost invisible. You think of somebody like um, Michael Jordan, who is hands down one of the best players ever. People are already second guessing whether or not he was the best player ever because we got guys like LeBron James just doing things different. Um, and actually I asked my eight year old um, DJ student, I said, Hey, um, have you heard that new Justin Bieber song? And the young man said, who's Justin Bieber? Oh, <laughs> makes me so feel old. Just, you just think about like all this impact that these people have come before us have done. And like, at some point the, whoever was the richest man 300 years ago, we don't even know who that person is. We can't even identify that. So what is the value of legacy? And so at this point, I don't even think it's about legacy. I think it's about maximizing impact while we're here, where our feet currently are. Yeah, it's very true. Like, even if you look at, uh, you know, we're big into movies and, and even sports and stuff like that you can mention a, a a basketball player from the fifties or sixties and said it was one of the best ever. And it's like, you automatically write them off because of that era, discounting everything about them and everything they put in and the time and effort and, and all of that. And you're like, nah, could never cut it today. That's crazy though. Yeah. And, and shout out just real quick, shout out to Quinn Buckner. Um, so I told you I'm affiliated with IU. I'm yeah. affiliated with the Indiana Pacers. Yeah. Well, he approached me the other day in the arena and, and, and mind you, forgive me, Quinn, so much, but I actually didn't know who he was when he approached me. And he said, Hey man, what's your name? Where are you from? We started talking a little bit. I said, what's your name, sir? He's like, my name's Quinn Buckner. And I remember hearing the name, but I knew Quinn Buckner as the reporter, as the game, the play-by-play -play analysis. He's on the 76 team, I think exactly where i'm going with this yeah. but then i find out he was an nba legend he was mm -hmm. an iu legend and these are things that i'm trying to embody and really be a part of and i didn't even know who he was mm -hmm. like shame on me for not understanding my history and props to him for all the things that he's done because indiana people should know who quinn buckner is but i just say that to say like that's the sad part about legacy sometimes as great as you are it seems like young people only really know what's relevant to them in the moment yeah, we're my 
my class the other day, we were talking about something and someone brought up Patrick Swayze and people were like, who the hell's that? Oh uh, no. Yeah. So yeah. Makes you feel old, but yeah. Uh, I can't thank you enough. I appreciate you taking time to do this. Um, folks definitely go check them out. Give them a follow all the social media platforms. Uh, final comments for our listeners. Uh, yeah, just whoever's hearing this, number one, thank you if you made it this far. Um, it means so much to me for people just to listen, to, for me to have a chance to share my story. And I don't know what it is that you're going through or struggling with or want to overcome, but just know that if you give it your consistent best effort, the one thing I can promise you is that things will be better than they were before you started. So thanks for listening. I mean, you got a good podcast voice. You would be good at podcasting. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. This is my first go around with it. So really? Uh, just with the podcast, with a podcast circuit, I should say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, you, you, just different theme than mine because your your voice, your pipes are a little bit better than mine, and then you got the DJ and technology skills. So as long as you're not like another category, I think you definitely, man, you could do some good stuff with that too. Man, well, thank you so much. Well, folks, I have enjoyed this episode. Uh, make sure you head over to whatever your preferred podcast platform is. Leave us a review if you like what you're listening to. Also support us on our YouTube channel. And folks, we will see you back next week with a brand new episode of The Shadows Podcast.